major, in between C major and E minor. Now I have three bars. I have a bar of C major, I have a bar of uh, F major, and then I have a bar of E minor. That's expansion. Oh, okay. Whereas, if I were to increase the density, I wouldn't change the amount of bars that I would have. I would still just have two bars, but I would make maybe the C major a uh, half note if we were four four, and I'm then with add you. a half note E minor. Right? You're increasing the density without changing the the time. Um, Th that makes expansion. perfect so, sense. I've got you now. Okay, it's it's related okay, to time. Right. Related to time. Okay, got you. Right. Exactly. It's just a full yes. Yeah, it's like, it's like time and space. Time, time versus space. I'm space. with you. Got you, um, yeah, yeah. Not just time. Okay. So then the next thing is that there is objective functionality and there is subjective functionality. And there are different kinds of both, right? So objective functionality basically just means that if I have a major, if I play a major chord, right, you know that it's a major chord and it has a certain sort of aesthetic sonority, which, um, uh, is objective, right? It's because it's based on the overtone series, which is objective, and the major chord has a brighter sound and sort of darker sound of the minor chord, right? You know, you're aware of this. But that's that's objective, right? Anyone coming into a piece of music is going, even if they've never heard music before, because of the fact that the overtone series is inherent in every note, unless you have a sine wave, you know, but even so, they've heard the overtone series before, they have a basic cognitive awareness to be able to to hear and feel that the E minor is darker than the C major, regardless of, even if they didn't hear the rest of the piece of the music, they don't know that composer's repertoire, and they've never heard any music themselves, right? It's objective. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So then the subjective is comparing one thing to the next thing, right? It goes back to the whole, if I play F sharp major after E major, it's going to sound bright, but if I play F sharp major after A flat major, it's going to sound dark, right, on the circle of fifth. Yes. So the, the subjective has to do with whether or not something um, uh, can be related to either what you have experienced before or what came before, right? Okay. So the dominant seventh chord, you know, one going, five going to one, has two, um, uh, has an objective component, and that a dominant seventh resolving to a major chord has a vertical resolution of dissonance, but it's also a familiar aesthetic because so many people have heard so much music that utilizes those um, sonorities. So there's a strength, there's a subjective strength, and there's an objective strength. Got you. So how does this tie back into the analysis? Well, okay, so, so kind of step by step back here, right? So first what you were trying to do is put on lots of different pairs of glasses to chunk the material so that you can see patterns where you might not have seen patterns before. Right? Sure, yep. Okay? And then there are two ways of chunking, right? You can reduce the density or you can reduce the expansions. Right? Ah, okay, okay. okay. Um, and then, once you see the patterns, or rather an, another step in being able to see patterns is putting on your objective glasses or your, versus your subjective glasses, right? You can compare sonorities according to how they make sense on the overtone series and see brightness and darkness and consonants and all those objective acoustic phenomena and you might see patterns, right? But you also can look at it subjectively and compare this chord progression to either a chord progression common in the literature or, but more importantly, especially with Danny Elfman, to the repertoire of Danny Elfman's other works or to just a previous place in the piece of music that you're studying or even elsewhere in the film score, right? Ah. And, and, and so you can say, okay, well, this, has, this, this, this progression maybe doesn't make a lot of particular sense with regard to Western Occidental music, right? Um, but it is used and associated with a particular aspect of a Spider-Man story so that when people hear it, that association is made, and maybe there, there's even some emotional association um, that is uh, cultivated between what's happening on screen and, and hearing the music, right? I'm like with you. you. certainly enjoy film music without the film, but if you heard the film music with the film, when you hear the music, you're, you're going to associate it with, with, with that which it was, it, it was mapped onto the film. Yes, right? of course. Okay, so, so assuming all that makes sense, then the last and final step is to compare the patterns that you find on all these different levels of abstraction to each other, right? The subjective, the objective, the density, the expansion, right? And compare patterns that you find between all of those different levels and then see what patterns arise on that level. Yeah. 
So that that's that's like a step by step, you know, kind of process of how you would go. And it still requires some, you know, it, it, it takes some. Uh, your brain gets better at, at seeing patterns and putting on lots of different glasses. Um, uh, but whenever I go look at a piece of music and I'm trying to figure out what's happening, I basically just constantly am trying on different pairs of glasses. Like, does it make sense from one bar to the next? Does it what make sense from one beat to the next? Right? And, and then, but the whole, I'll give you a simple example of the sort of meta comparing abstraction, right? If there is a correlation, I'll give you a very simple example. If there is a correlation between an instrumentation choice and a chord progression or a certain harmonic palette, then that correlation has artistic meaning. So let's say whenever the harp plays, it plays a very simple sort of, uh, we'll say, minor diatonic progression or, or whatnot. But sure. then whenever the strings come in in a certain register, um, and register is another you know, perimeter, whenever the strings come in, maybe they play sort of augmented sonorities, right? So then not only do you understand that the, that, that, that you have a consistency of this section being augmented and this section being diatonic, and also a consistency of this section being harp and this section being string, but that the strings are mapped and correlated onto the augmented sonorities, and the diatonic is mapped onto the harp, right? Okay. And you can continue to do that with rhythm, and you can do that with timbre and with texture and with counterpoint, and then when you, can, when you get to the point of being able to map all of these things onto every other thing, then you can start to see... The, the, the whole structure, so to speak, it's, you know, like what you're, what you're doing is sort of like, you know, t you, you take, there are some little holographic um, uh, <laughs> prism hmm. things that basically have a bunch of tiny little pointillistic um, dots inside of them, and if you shine a light inside of them at a certain wavelength, it spits out a perfect image, just like a holograph, on the wall, right? So it's like what you are doing, right? Your right brain lets you hear and see the image, but your left brain doesn't let you know the points just by looking at the image of the wall. What you have to do is dissect the rock, so to speak, right? Dissect the little crystal. And but when you dissect it, since you don't have the image right in front of you and you can't really connect, basically that, that's really what it is. It is figuring out how this little crystal with all of its different little pointillistic patterns that you can't seem to make sense of, how that ends up making the picture that you see on the wall. Mm. When you hear music and you feel its emotional impact, it's like you're immediately seeing the picture without any effort, just the whole thing. But then what you have to do is use your left brain to make the, because you can certainly enjoy the music and just see it on the wall, sure. but you're not going to know how to compose it unless you can connect the little pointillistic dots in the crystal with what is going on the screen. And the only way to make sense of those dots is by looking at them at different levels of abstraction. You could say, okay, well, certain dots correspond to different colors, and when they're in, when they're in a certain pattern in this way, they make a certain shape, right? And, and when the dots are thicker, they let more light through, mm. and less thick, they let less light through. And as you do that, you can sort of develop a, a, a sort of picture in your mind, and the closer that the picture in your mind that you've created in your left brain from the little points, the closer that that becomes to the actual picture that you are seeing with your right brain, so to speak, the, the more you know that your analysis is correct, right? And that's the whole thing. It's like if, 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 if uh, so many people are afraid or, you know, criticize music theorists for coming up with analysis analyses that make logical sense but are just BS because they don't really... You know, it's like a stretch, you know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the music. And I think the, w the way that you know that you're going in the right di direction and the way to constrain your analysis towards a, a direction that actually helps you understand the piece from a compositional perspective is to compare whether or not the obser observations of patterns that you find is, uh, can be mapped onto and correlates with and is congruent with the emotion and aesthetic that the piece of music makes you feel when you just listen to it without thinking about it. Uh, and, 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 of course, no one can ever really get to the point of perfectly syncing those two, but you can get pretty close, and I think that that's, that's how you know if there's just so much happening and there's so many patterns and you just can't really make sense of it. You can sort of compare the full picture with the details and keep looking at that when you try your different glasses and look for patterns, and the closer you feel like you're getting to that, that's how you know that your analysis is, is, is correct, so uh, to speak. Uh, okay, wow. 
Uh, that's a lot, and I really appreciate it. Um, I um, I don't know. Then, um, I mean, that was that that was a lot, and I I don't know if there's any way to without going down a big rabbit trail of relating that to like one small chunk of the Spider-Man um, theme itself. Um, like for for example, the second section, you know, how you say to stick to one or two ideas, you know, to, I forget what was it, two or three ideas. Well, it seems to me like it's a brand new idea, and maybe it is, and maybe I'm overthinking it, um, or maybe it's like a, you know, it, it's a fragment of the melody in disguise, and I'm just, and that's, and I, I can't make out. The, well, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So that's okay. So the two things there. So one. Um, uh, it's, remember, nothing is ever totally brand new. It's just on a spectrum of, of how closely you can relate different perimeters to what came before it. So if it doesn't immediately sound like it's related on a conscious level, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not related, right? Yep. If, if suddenly if suddenly the piece of music just started playing some, you know, music box theme that, you know, I mean, if you, if you change the rhythm, it, like in everything, you know, and, and, uh, there, there's, there's always going to be some aspect, even just the fact that it's using t- t- the 12 tone equally tempered tuning system, that's sure. related to what came b- before. Got you. I'm with you. Yep. So, uh, yeah. So, so uh, the thing is, I would definitely look at all of these different levels of abstraction. Look at, look at, look at the harmony. Look, you know, look at from bar to bar, and then look at from beat to beat, and try and see if you can find any patterns that not only make sense on their own merit, but also make sense as to what came before, right? Sure. And and also remember too that the whole idea of abstraction is that you can map things emotionally and not as to the specific manifestation. So, for example, if I, if I told you two words, huge and colossal, on the surface level, those words have uh, literally no letters in common, right? They, they don't have any suffixes or prefixes in common, and you're like, what on earth? You know, but <laughs> if you understood, you know, the Greek and Latin languages and all, you know, even if you didn't know what those words meant, you might be able to infer if you look deep down enough, ah, these words mean the same thing, right? Sure. So if, if, if I have a particular chord progression, for example, if I have a diatonic chord progression that is largely diatonic on the, on the larger beat frameworks, right, the sort yep. of more meta structure, but sure. then on the smaller scale, it adds modulatory structures that, you know, sort of give it a whimsical flavor, which is very much like what Elfman constantly does. If, if that, if a new chord progression that on the surface level doesn't use the same chord relationships, but it uses that same technique of starting out with a diatonic progression and then introducing mm. the modulatory structures, that, in, on, on in the abstract level, relates those two things together, and it sounds like it has a similar sort of aesthetic of taking the, the normative and making it whimsical, even though on the surface level, you, you maybe say, well, this chord progression is different from that, so how is it related? It's still related in that the concept of starting with diatonic and then, in, and then intersposing, juxtaposing, and expanding and, and densifying with modulatory structures, specifically because that's the thing, is like you could take... You could add crazy chords at random, where sometimes the crazy chords are on stronger beats and sometimes the crazy chords are on weaker beats, right? And that would immediately give it a sense of incoherency. But if the stronger beats are largely diatonic and the weaker ones are the ones that contain the modulatory structures, that really does give it a sense of order, a hierarchical order. Right? Uh, does, that, does, that make, does that make sense? Yes, it does, it does. So I wouldn't necessarily be overly, not that you're obsessed, but I wouldn't necessarily be overly obsessed with trying to directly correlate like specific chord progressions and specific motives on a note by note basis from one thing to the next thing, right? They might be related on a more abstract level. Yeah. And that's the thing, when you listen to the piece of music, does it sound coherent? Oh yeah. Sound like one thing? So that's so you know intuitively that there is some connection between the two of them. So if you just can't seem to find a relationship on the surface level, it just means that you're wearing the wrong pair of glasses. Uh, you can trust you can trust your ears aesthetic you know visceral sense of uh, you just hear it you feel that there's something that's communicating something that's emotionally coherent you can use that to, to sort of trust the fact that this cave is worth digging because you're going to find diamonds but if you can't find diamonds then the logical step must be that well since you know that there are diamonds in the cave because you can sense it emotionally sure and if you can't find the diamond it means either you're using the wrong pickaxe or you're looking in the wrong place yeah 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 for sure um 
And I, I think I am, I mean, part of like what I want to get into, I think with the lesson then will be which pickaxe or which glasses are, are would you, do, do I even have that pair of glasses um, in my, in my toolkit, right? Um, right? Yeah. Um, it feels like I should, like, I'm like, okay, well, that looks like planing. That looks like, the, whoa, why did it go to A flat? <laughs> you know? Uh, and then, and then why does this, um, this particular melody, bop, 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 how does that, like, how is that connected to the, the melody that was set up so, um, so, you know, uh, craftily in the beginning, right? That they sound like two different melodies, but yet it, it, it still all works, but, but I mean, it comes back to, did he introduce a new idea or did he sort of like, you know, invert the other idea? Like what, what exactly, I, I, I can't consciously figure out that well, and it's fascinating. Example, to... right? So I, I know, I know there are two parts you're thinking of, right? So, so, so one example is, is the first melody, right? Yes. It starts on the fifth degree of a minor, some type of minor scale because it starts yep. with an A on a D minor. Chord, I'm with right? you there. Yep. Later all the way. On, that melody, even though its continuation is completely different and stretches out, but we can say two things about it. One is that it, it starts on a minor chord on the fifth scale degree, which immediately relates it back to the previous uh... melody, right? It starts from the same place, but the fact that it is deliberately more expansive uh... than the first melody gives it a coherent sense of contrast, like it's building, right? Uh... And so... So, again, it's, it, you're, it's like an essay, you know, to compare and contrast. The contrasts are just as important as the comparison. It's only when things are in that sort of vague middle ground where it's not exactly the same, but it's also not exactly different. That's, that's bad music, you know what I mean? Got it. Music where things aren't similar enough to, like, be related, but they aren't different enough to be interesting. It's just sort of, like, randomness. Yes, right? yes. You know, that, that, that's where it's, it's bad music. But, but again, if you, if you, um, uh, okay, I'll give, I'll give another example, too. You know, if you try and make sense of, like, the a flat major chord with regard to, like, the circle of fifths and octatonicism and all these sort of pickaxes that you have, uh -huh. well, remember, you don't just want to think about any one musical perimeter and throw all the other ones out. You want to relate them together. So don't just think about harmony. Think about melody, right? If you have the note C on an F major chord, and then you have the note C with harmonized via A flat, the fact that, because if you just say it, and harmonically speaking, F major and A flat major, right, you could have A going to A flat, you know, you can have all kinds sure. of different notes on top of that. Sure. And so, yeah, so, so within the realm of the possible melodic structures that you can have on top of those two chords, A flat and F major, you know, if you happen to have some sort of common note, then that also draws those two things together. So, uh, based upon what you're saying with regard to like the different pickaxes, it seems to me like you might, because we've talked a lot about harmony recently, you know what I mean? Yeah. It seems to me like you might be overusing pickaxes from specific perimeters of music, just focusing on the harmony or just focusing on the uh, or just focusing on, uh, on the melody one at a time rather than trying to relate them together. Uh, sometimes it's in the relationship of those things together where the, where things make sense. Got you. Okay. And when you listen, you hear all those things together, right? When you listen to it, you can't separate the melody from the rhythm, from the harmony. No. The they, all, they all just coexist. No, but it's hard to switch the glasses sort of instantaneously, and I know that comes with practice as well. Um, right. Well, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, but what you're saying or what you're hinting to me is that his melody may have led him to choose a different harmonic choice, and I'm looking at how, how the harmony might be coherently connected when it was really the melody that was guiding the harmony type of. Right. Exactly. Uh, uh, if he, if he, can, if he um, used the melody to create a sense of continuity or continue the melody, but then after the melody was created, then decided to reharmonize it, that means by very definition that if you are only looking at the harmony, you're not going to see that path that he took. Got you. Okay. And then the path that he took as far as the melody is more of an expansion then. It starts on the fifth of a minor chord, and then, and then sort of has a different arc to it, but that arc is different right. enough that it gives contrast, like you said, and a feeling of like, hey, this is this is building um, as it, as we right, right. as we as you would want to. Uh, that's the aesthetic you're going for as the piece uh, evolves. Okay, okay. Right, and then and then once you study these things, and continue back and don't get so focused on. And this may not be what you're doing, but don't get so focused on just looking at the notes. 
that you sort of, I don't want to say forget, but you lose the visceral sense of what it feels like to listen to it. Anytime I go and study something, um, I will continually, after I feel like I've made some headway, go back and listen to it and sort of compare what it makes me feel when I listen to it to the way that I'm studying it, whether or not that makes sense. Uh -huh. And then you can start to theorize subjectively about what, how these musical things they map on and another layer of abstraction to the story. You know, so, ya, da, 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 right? So the fact that that original progression is sort of half diatonic and very simple and very constrained to a small number of notes, yep. um, but then sort of gets more and more whimsical as sort of like this ordinary guy, Peter Parker, who, you know, was uh, by, the out, by the outside forces of the world, you know, was bitten and then became this guy and he's sort of awkward and doesn't really know how to be a superhero. But as the story goes on, Peter Parker becomes more and more powerful and um, the situations that he gets in are, are less and less domestic and more and more larger scale. And so you can sort of then map that off the melody, then you listen to the melody and you feel how it, it sort of expresses in a, in a small amount of time the story of Spider-Man. And if you feel like emotionally, it, it, what you hear it as is congruent with that conceptualization, then that also helps you to make sense of it, not just with regards to whether or not it makes musical sense, but also with regards to whether or not it makes sense as an expression of the story, uh, which is definitely also useful for you if you're interested in being a film or game composer, uh, where the story is always paramount, you know? Yeah. And that's another thing. Not, not only do I, how do I start writing a piece of music from an emotion, but how do I convert well, how do I watch a piece of film or play a video game and develop a coherent emotional uh, interpretation of that? And then how do I convert those emotions into particular musical ideas, right? Oh, yeah. There are an endless, there are in, there are an endless number of ways that you can, as you know, score a film or interpret a scene, you know, and what you can bring out with the music. Sure, sure. Okay. All right, well, that makes sense as well, too, especially going back to what we talked about with the story and, uh, it, uh, you know, vertical, uh, vertical, vertical aesthetic being related to the environment and the or, or how you feel about an environment and the horizontal about, or vice versa, rather. I think horizontal, right. yeah, yeah. So, okay, okay. And, and yeah, it definitely gets a sense of like he's becoming more under control of his powers as the as the theme gets larger and more expansive. Like you're saying, like when it's compact, it's like, well, hey, he's kind of feeling it out. Maybe he's just jumping off the building for the first right, time. Exactly. Ah, that's also subconscious. Okay, but yeah, it makes right. perfect sense. 